live from the Hollywood Improv in luscious Los Angeles, California, it's the Nighttime Show! With us as always, our head writer, Matt Walker. I'm the voice of the Nighttime Show, Mike Black. And we, of course, have our host, but we'll get to him in a moment because we have a very special guest. Legendary star of stage and screen, three-time Emmy winner, star of The West Wing, Cabin in the Woods, and the Academy Award-winning film Get Out, Bradley Whitford! And now, a man who puts all the donuts in the sunken place, Stephen Kramer Glickman! (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Oh, my God. That was amazing. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) I know, right? It's a lot of energy. He puts out a lot. It's Mike Black. Mike Black really is a hell of an announcer. I'll be very quiet the rest of the show. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I might might even nap. He's got to rest his voice now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Bradley Whitford, it is an absolute honor, sir. This is so cool. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm very excited uh, to be here. A uh, little warning, I uh, had a root canal uh, oh. this morning, oh. Oh. so there's a tiny bit of pain medication going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's understandable. Quick, ask him, so, ask him the craziest questions right now okay. before where's I would yeah, love yeah, to yeah. know what that intro sounded like on pain medication. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm glad I had it just for the intro. <laughs> have, now, during like quarantine and all this stuff that's been happening, have you been working at all? Or are you, what, what are you doing during this time to you know for yourself? Uh. You know, I, I, it's been, it's been an interesting time. I'm I, I had the uh, odd experience of working on one of the first sort of uh, SAG sanctioned movies, a movie called Songbird, mm-hmm. uh, which takes place during a pandemic, which kind of allowed it to be shot. It was it was oh, really wow. bizarre. Oh my god! Um, and you know, all these new protocols are uh yeah it's 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 really it's intense everybody's you know suited up like they're going into surgery and there's like (laughs) three different levels of sterility and you know once you get to the highest level it's just the actors who have been tested and take their masks off um and we just had a big meeting because we're going back on uh handmaid's tale and they're very serious uh about it in canada and by serious i mean rational (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah um i have a lot of my family in canada and in montreal if you don't live in uh, the building like in the you know in the apartment building you're not allowed into the building it is it's it's like every it's like basically a, a full you know no guests allowed kind of thing. And it's yeah. kept every, cause the elderly population there is just is, you know, is big. So they, yeah. they've done a great job. Are you that. sure it's not just, they told your family that nobody was allowed. So they didn't have to hang out with them. Is that, could be it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's just, just your family. They're, like, they're yeah, just annoying. Just, we don't want to know. They're like, they're like, but they okay. won't, they, they won't let you in without like a, a two weeks quarantine. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, uh, and I realized somehow I live in a world where I get more house arrest time than Roger fucking Stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Are you yeah. are you looking forward to getting back to uh, Handmaid's Tale? Uh, you know, creatively, yes. Uh, you know what it yeah. does, and they are wonderful. Uh, they understand, you know, usually I would just go back and forth. I have a, a daughter going into her senior year in high school. Uh, and normally I would zip up, shoot, you know, zip right back. Um, but now it's a little more difficult. But they've been very helpful sort of clustering uh, the shooting. But, yeah, I mean, th- that show is is an extraordinary acting experience. Oh, yeah. Oh wow! The uh, since you guys are comedians, uh, let me uh, let me tell you one funny thing from that set. As you Please. know, uh, the Canadians are stereotypically and genetically the kindest, sweetest human beings on the planet. Yes, yes. Uh, and then I don't know if you've seen *Handmaid's Tale*, but the material's a little rough. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. So, yeah. so the contrast, like you'll be on the set and. 
the AD will uh, uh, will walk up to you and go, "Hey, uh, I don't I don't want to rush you, but uh, I think we should get the nooses on the girls." <laughs> <laughs> It's a very bizarre. <laughs> very oh my bizarre God. That's a, Yeah, that's amazing. What do you? I know that you've you've gotten to spend some time with Elizabeth Moss on that. What's uh? What's she like to to work with? I gotta tell you, uh, you know, I I, I have the job. I have no reason to uh, blow smoke up her ass. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I find what she is doing on and off screen creatively to be um the, honestly the most impressive thing i've, I've encountered <laughs> in mm-hmm. show business i mean she's doing that the degree of difficulty on that part you know it's sophie's choice the series yeah yeah is, is is basically what what she's going through she is involved in every draft of every script uh, she spends her one day off um, going over shots uh, wow. for the next week. She, I've never heard an unkind or pretentious word uh, come out of her mouth. It's the, the atmosphere on the set is kind, gentle, loose, funny. She'll do these amazing takes, you know, with the camera grinding down is there a is there a drum beat happening now i i'm hearing it clicking and oh, i sorry it's just my i think my phone was getting a text message in so let me clear that out I, uh, my notifications turned off but sometimes it doesn't do what i tell it to so oh uh, <laughs> it'd be really funny if i just went nuts and said this is really <laughs> You're like, fuck this <laughs> <How respectful. laughs> we're talking about my goddamn handmaid's tale here You're talking about my career <laughs> I'm trying to tell you how kind and giving one of my fellow actors is, and you're ruining it. She is so kind to everybody. Turn off phone. Uh, no, she is. Uh, I, I, you know, and there are actors who are producers and executive producers uh, who are basically just actors who kind of got another credit. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that because I've been that guy. <laughs> uh, um, but she, I've never seen anyone uh, uh, so involved. And she was, uh, I, I've been saying to her, uh, you need to direct. I mean, and she's like, oh, you know, I don't know. And I, I, I was like, you're so ready. And it was right in the middle of her episode. Uh, that we shut down, so we'll go back. But uh, I, you will. Uh, I, I, nobody has blown me away in their sort of passion, their kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I met her when she was, uh, you know, seventeen on the West Wing. Wow. So, oh, so how does yeah. well, because she used to be a on, filmmaker. And on West Wing, you you uh, took a swing and wrote an episode of that show. Did you did you write on, uh, or I wrote did you get two. credit? Mm-hmm. You did. Uh, I wrote two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's an amazing story. Uh, one of the truly unsung heroes of the West Wing experience uh, was John Wells, uh, who the only way we were able to do that show and Aaron was able to do it the way he wanted to. Um, and Tommy uh, Tommy Shlomi, our executive producer. Go ahead, laugh at the name. <laughs> uh, um, the only way we were able to have the freedom that we had uh, from network interference uh, was because John Wells put all of his ER swing uh, around us uh, yeah. and allowed Aaron to work the only way Aaron knows how. Um, uh, which is an extraordinarily risky way to write. You basically, to do a show, you've got one person mm-hmm. um, who uh, does not write ahead, uh, is not the kind of guy who can operate in a system where you map out a season and then you, and then you fill it in. Um, it's a, a kind of a hair-raising way to do a television show. You know, yeah. Aaron used to walk around and say, 
I swear to God, if if anybody has an idea for a teaser, I'll give them ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh so he's doing like the Coppola <laughs> ending of Apocalypse Now, just sort of let's see what happens, kind of. Well, yeah, I, there are real. It's interesting because there's real virtues. Uh, to it. What's, mm-hmm. what's most amazing that I want to express is that John Wells, this goes against the way any responsible uh, <laughs> showrunner would allow yes. a show to be run. You, you should have a team, you mm-hmm. should be working, you know, five scripts ahead. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about this is because I asked John, like, how were you uh, able to, um, you know, have a show run the opposite way? of the way you truly believe a show should be run. And uh, John said, uh, cause uh, you have to go with the talent and uh, Aaron's, you know, Aaron was a freak mm-hmm. uh, and brilliant and uh, a better writer than, uh, than I could be. John was always very sort of self-deprecating and in a very astute way understood that Aaron was a singular talent who needed to work in a singular way. And what you get from that is um, Aaron, like uh, Donna, played by Janelle Maloney, uh, we ne- you know, he wasn't writing ahead. So this character that was hired for one day in the pilot, Aaron is watching the dailies and going, oh, that's cool. There's something going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Aaron really was able to um, uh, watch the actors and sort of learn how to exploit them in the best sense of the word. Like, right. Uh, in a way he wouldn't have been able to if he um, had planned out the season. Yeah, if it's mapped uh, out, then there's no opportunity to bring her back. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. look at, you know, like uh, we were talking the other day about David Milch and, mm-hmm. and, and how Milch would write on set, like as, like kind of write as they yeah. were working. Yeah. Yeah. And Aaron Sorkin is one of the only other people of, of that, you know, caliber who has right. been, you know, doing this for like that uh, long. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I mean, what, what Aaron did will never happen again. Um, yeah. Uh, Aaron wrote uh, 22 episodes, uh, 22 hours, uh, which is basically the equivalent of 11 feature films. Yeah, Man. every not every nine months for four years. No one will. <laughs> oh my! No one will ever ever do it again. And yeah. the first year, he also wrote 22 half hour sports nights i i mean he was oh yeah god shit like how does he have time to do anything it's crazy well it was insane and he's you know he was you know an obsessive um brilliant guy you know uh, just um on a tear and yeah it's, it's amazing that so much of what you're saying about that process and about uh the writer and the showrunner uh, was translated into your character and Matthew Perry's in Studio 60. Right, right. And well, when right, I first is... saw that and uh, saw like that, oh, his character is going to write the whole season, I was like, horse shit. No one could do that. <laughs> and then I learned more about it and I was like, oh my God, somebody did that. But with a much more complicated show. Yeah, you know? yeah a, re- a really, really complicated show. But then, uh, understandably, after four years, Aaron... Um, uh, I mean, I remember we're sitting in the Roosevelt room and, you know, Aaron and Tommy are coming in. We, we all see the look on their faces and we're like, oh my God. Uh, and they were telling us that they were leaving at the end of the year. Um, and we all felt like, you know, Branch Davidians, if like David Koresh said, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, just burn like the set down. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. where are you going, man? Like, <laughs> like I, I'm not sure we can do it without you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and John was incredibly gracious when that happened. He wrote the first script because he wants to follow Aaron Sorkin. Yeah. Right. Uh, first script back, he said at the read through, he said, "I feel like Ethel Merman's understudy." <laughs> um, and then uh, I. Uh, 
about a year and a half after that, I was about to direct. Um, and I had a story idea and I went to John's office uh, because there's a wonderful writer named Eli Addy, who's a dear friend. And I had an idea for a script and I just wanted to know if I could work on it with Eli and that that might be the episode that I direct. And, and, and John said, what's the idea? I told him, he said, write an outline. I said, I don't know what that means. He said, <laughs> write, uh, just tell me the story in a page. And he called me in the next day, he said, make it three pages. And then he said, make it five pages. And then he said, okay, um, uh, I won't let you, I, he doesn't let people direct what they've written, right. uh, which is uh, a good policy. But he said, <laughs> I think your idea, uh, <laughs> I like your idea better than mine. If you can give me um, 70 pages in in a week, uh, I'll put it on TV. And if you crash and burn, um, you know, I'll take over. Wow. So amazing. I, I, it was terrifying. You know, I was shooting, but, um, it was a couple of all nighters. Um, and it was very bizarre going Mm -hmm. from having never kind of written anything. And then two weeks later, you know, Alice and Janney's performing a monologue (laughs) that you wrote. (laughs) Yeah, which which was intense. And then John, um, that first experience was really good. And then John invited me uh, into the writer's room to go through the normal process. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And that writer's room was an amazing place. You know, it's like Lawrence O'Donnell. John Wells is like a, you know, a great New Yorker editor. Nobody is better at, you know you know sitting in a room so that was that was an amazing experience <laughs> I'll, I'll say the last three minutes of the podcast is better than anything sid field ever wrote yeah, yeah. <laughs> for learning how to do a script exactly <laughs> <laughs> hey uh real quick before we continue the show um i want to talk about a third generation family run business that i am very proud to be working with uh sennheiser is the number one Number top tier <laughs> microphone uh, company in the mm-hmm. world. And we are so lucky that we are now recording our show using Sennheiser microphones and their headphones. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. We're, we're talking into Sennheiser MD42 microphones and using Sennheiser HD25 headphones. And these sound amazing. I mean, listen to Mike Black's voice. Listen to the rich and sumptuous soundscape that comes out of my voice. Oh. Every time I speak into a Sennheiser. Absolutely. Go check out uh, their microphones and their sound equipment over at Sennheiser.com. All right. Let's get back to the show. Um, I I, I got a question for you about um, – this is a memory that I have, and I wanted to see if – if you would remember this or not, but oh, uh, that was oh, one get... crazy night. Man. <laughs> it, it really was. Stephen I... had a root canal, and he was on a lot of pain medication. Yeah. Still can't <laughs> believe it happened. Um, Studio sixty on the Sunset Strip uh, had a screening of the pilot episode at uh, the Screen Actors Guild, and the and you and the I believe you and the rest of the cast, or most of the cast, was there, including um, uh, Matthew Perry. And uh, do do you remember that at all, or not really? Yeah, no, I I I do remember it because Matt, who can make me laugh harder than almost any other human being, uh, I paused as I am told I do often when I speak, <laughs> uh, which is funny because I sort of got famous for talking fast, but in life I'm <laughs> you know you're William blind. Shatner in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of odd pauses. And I remember I paused for a second and Matt said, uh, you realize we're still here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, uh, Matt I, I have to tell you, Matt told me the funniest story. <laughs> he, and I don't think he would, he would have a problem with me saying this. He, um, you know, Matt went through very difficult stuff. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Matt was um, at one point, you know, kind of a movie star. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it looked like, you know, he was kind of getting, you know, big parts uh, in movies. 
And then before Studio 60, that had kind of gone away. Um, you know, he was dealing with personal issues and everything. And he called his agents at, at uh, CAA. And, you know, he's made a lot of money for them, clearly, over the years. And he said, can I just get the whole team uh, together uh, in a room? I just, I just really, it's important for me to just kind of get something clear. And they're like, yeah, sure, you know, of course, of course. So all these agents go, <laughs> go into this like meeting room. And Mac goes, uh, listen, I understand. I, I, I'm just trying to get a clear view of the horizon here. Um, I'm not being offered leads in movies anymore, am I? And there's this kind of uncomfortable pause and they kind of go, well, no, no. <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, and I'm, I'm imagining <laughs> it's hard to get me an audition uh even for some of those things because of the stuff that's been going on and they're like yeah yeah it's a little tough and he's like it's basically the same thing for kind of supporting parts i'm not getting offered them and they don't really want me to audition is that true and they're and they're kind of squirming in their, <laughs> in their oh, chairs wow. uh and they go yeah i mean to be honest you know to be frank yeah that's what's happening right now and he said um Right. So here's my question. Am I allowed to go to the movies? (laughs) 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 Wow. That's so funny. Uh, Anyway, I love him a lot. uh, And he's a a, a heroic, battle-tested guy. But man, is he funny. Oh, Oh, there is somewhere, somewhere on YouTube. We're, we're doing one of these satellite tours where you like get up at five and you have like 70, you know, two minute interviews yeah. with the whole places junket. All, over, all, all over the country. And this, uh, we're really punchy and like two hours into it. And, um, this guy ends his question with like, um, you know, both of you guys are known, um, for uh, the characters uh, you you played in Friends and in West Wing, um, when you're moving on to something like this, is it hard to to shake th- uh, that character? And I just was so tired. I said, "Well, you you shook your Chandler this morning, didn't you?" <laughs> <laughs> Which is just a stupid <laughs> joke, but. <laughs> Somewhere on YouTube, you get we just completely <laughs> fall. Oh my god! Oh my god! So I have a friend who is a super fan, uh, the lovely and talented Laura Valdivia. She would have murdered me if I didn't ask you about the ER episode you did, "Love's Labor's Lost." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, and that's yeah. Uh, that's when I first met uh, John Wells. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a, a like uh, that uh, when you just hear a description of the episode, you know that this is going to be intense. And uh, when you read the episode, uh, and then it was especially when it first came out. Um, I mean, I haven't seen it since it first came out, but wow, uh, it's it's very very upsetting. Um, uh, it's incredibly hard to watch. I mean, it's it, what, as what happens in the in the what's the main? Basically, um, a, a, what seems like an incidental story of a complicated labor goes totally, totally south. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, I, there's a really interesting thing that happens in the end of that, which I think is a a storytelling lesson um, that I thought they did really well. There's a moment where, I mean, this thing was on like 20 years ago. So yeah, and people still talk <laughs> I, about it. It was that. I, I, so I, I, I don't, th- I, I don't think I'm spoiling anything. But no, yeah, uh, yeah. The, uh, Tony Edwards' character comes up, and um, I am with my newborn child, and he is delivering the news. Uh, that uh, my wife has died, right? Giving birth to yeah. <laughs> right, right. They they got the baby out, and then um, uh, she had eclampsia, and she died. So here's a scene that is written where 
the, Tony comes in and gives me the worst imaginable news. And we shoot it as you, you know, we shoot Tony's side, uh, we shoot my side. There's this very, you know, it gets very emotional uh, and very raw. And then if you watch the episode, what they did was they cut out all the music. They, um, you have Tony walking down corridors, walk, and the audience knows he's got to deliver this news. And oh, wow. instead of coming in to see how difficult it is for him and how, uh, you know, horrific it is for me, you see it from about 30 feet back and you see him talking to me and then you see my posture change. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really interesting because you very often, uh, when you leave it to the audience, when you don't show them absolutely everything, yeah, their imagination is so much more powerful. Yeah, mm. than, uh, um, and it was just a really interesting uh, uh, mini leader. The great director uh, directed that, and it uh, and I always think of that um, the sort of brilliance of laying back um, and watching the horror from afar, which makes you fill in uh with you with your own yeah. imagination and that's yeah. that's very different from the first time you worked with anthony edwards on revenge of the nerds too nerd colon <laughs> nerds in paradise yes, yes. <laughs> nice transition yes. mr walker very nice sir yeah, yeah. as, as yeah. the biggest I, nerd in the room i kind of want to talk about a movie that inspired me when i was younger but. by by the way uh for all the uh you know people always say well how'd you meet aaron sorkin how did I get the West Wing? Mm -hmm. I uh, was cast in uh, Revenge of the Nerds to colon Nerds of Paradise. <laughs> uh, and uh, Tim Busfield oh, uh, yeah. was in it. And I was real snobby. I was like, I, you know, I, all I was playing, I would joke that uh, I remember saying to my agent, is this going to hurt my career? And my agent goes, <laughs> You, you don't have a career to hurt. <laughs> uh, I met Tim uh, Busfield. Tim and I are sort of theater rats. Mm -hmm. He played uh, uh, Poindexter in the film, yes. correct? Poindexter, one yeah. of the most beautiful moments uh, uh, <laughs> in the film comedy history mm -hmm. is when they're all napping and it's like a panning shot. <laughs> And you go by Poindexter, and he's got an erection. It's just, <laughs> it's just beautiful. That's some deep uh, character work. Yeah. yeah. They didn't leave it so to the imagination, that director. No. <laughs> Tim and I started hanging out. We went to the theater festival in Louisville, and uh, Tim ended up replacing Tom Hulse in A Few Good Men. And oh god, we have to get to Josh Molina. But um, oh, wow. oh my god! Uh, and uh, Tim said to Aaron, "You should look at this guy." Mm -hmm. uh, so I got cast as sort of the Kevin Bacon part when Tim was the Tom Cruise part, and then Aaron uh, really kind of went to bat for me. Usually replacements in Broadway shows are, no offense to me, washed up television actors. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. and, and he really fought uh, for me to have that part. So I got to play it for like, I don't know, seven months or something. My dressing room was bigger than my apartment. Now, was that um, your first Broadway show? Yeah, I had done, uh, oh man, I got good. I, 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 I had done off Broadway, um, yeah. and I'd done a lot of regional theater, but that was my first Broadway. Show. Did you feel a big difference between the two? Yeah, I, I mean, replacing in a going into a Broadway show. I mean, I guess I do one of you know you guys do it too. I mean, no. public speaking, standing up in front of people, terrifying. Like I've spent my life doing things that are. 
generally thought of as you know terrifying. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of like getting nervous, nothing is scarier than going into a Broadway play because you you only rehearse with the stage manager, and then you do one put in with a cast that does not want to be at the put in rehearsal, and then <laughs> oh, man, and then you jump on this train which you know in that case was you know sort of every other line for you know two hours and 40 minutes it was terrifying wow yeah. that's not easy. and, and there are people that have probably seen the show a bunch of times that that will know if you make a single tiny mistake yeah there's nothing more difficult to negotiate for me as an actor as when you're rehearsing you're coming into a new situation in a play yeah. with people who've been doing it for a while and they're in the scene acting with you and you can see that they really are not sure if you're ever going to be any good. What wow. other, what other shows have you done on Broadway? Uh, I, Oh, I did uh, Boeing Boeing with Mark Rylance. Who, mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, you want to hear a good story? <laughs> oh my God. Of yeah. course. Come on. Yes. Do you know who Mark Rylance is? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, you know, he's won, uh, what was it? The Spies movie. Uh, he won an Oscar for. Yeah, Bri- he did Bridge oh. of Spies, uh, yeah. Dunkirk. Right. Ready Player One, a yeah. ton of stuff. Yeah. And he is pretty inarguably the greatest stage actor of, you know, of my generation. He was running the Globe in London when he was uh, 30 years old, he's played, wow. ha- uh, you know, Hamlet a dozen times, every, every role he's played the women. And <laughs> he's this very bizarre combination of the most technically proficient actor on the planet. Uh, and it, it, and at the same time, it's like you're working with a cat. Like if any, <laughs> he will, it, it actually was a real acting. It, it really changed the way I think about acting because I realized you try to figure out what's so brilliant about this guy and what he's constantly doing is trying to remain innocent to the moment while simultaneously fulfilling the external technical um, demands of of the scene that you're doing, but if anything happens, uh, and it makes him great to do a long run with, because if you change your performance at all, he's right with it. Like he's mm-hmm. there. Oh, that's cool. He's absolutely in the moment. So the play, uh, it's a sex farce. It's the stupidest, <laughs> most joyous, <laughs> like profoundly unimportant, deeply shallow sex farce. Okay. <laughs> And it's set in um, like 1960 uh, in Paris. And um, he, uh, like, we'd be sitting doing all this exposition at the beginning. And if somebody's cell phone went off, he would turn out toward the audience, look back at me and go, what is, what is that sound? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'd have to say, I think I said that's a sound from the future, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and, then, and then you would get him back on board. So this is the story and this is worth it. I know it's a long run up. No, it's so, <laughs> no I'm fascinated. Six. Uh, I've been doing it for like six months, uh, you know, eight times a week. And he's downstage towards the audience. I'm upstage. He's backlit. And we're doing the scene at the beginning of the play. And I can see, and it's not a little fly. It's like a deer fly is on his hair. He can't feel it, oh, no. but, it's, but it's backlit. <laughs> and so it looks like, a, like he has a, you know, a, a tumorous monster on his head. <laughs> and he sees my eyes kind of giggle. We don't go off the words at all. Mm-hmm. But he sees my eyes kind of giggle. He kind of cocks his eyes. And I indicate to him, you know, just casually that there's something on his head. Um, it's a total nothing moment. Uh, he shoes the fly away. We walk off 20 seconds later. We don't even mention it. (laughs) 
I'm off stage, uh, you know, doubting myself. He <laughs> is uh, <clears throat> on stage alone. And he would often, you would hear these kind of weird laughs. He's sort of exploring this apartment. And I start hearing really bizarre laughs that start to like, and I'm looking up at the monitor going, God, what the fuck is he doing out there? <laughs> and, um, and there are these crescendos, crescendos, and then this huge, ooh, and ah, you know, release. So uh, I don't know, but he has poured himself a, a glass of fake scotch and he's looking around the apartment and he sees the fly and he starts following the fly mm -hmm. and <laughs> he gets the fly. All these oohs and ahs are happening because he has gotten the fly to land on the lip of the glass <laughs> and he has tilted the glass. So it looks like he gave the fly a drink and then he releases the fly into the air in an orgasmic <laughs> release because <laughs> we are now in theater you know, we're in church with the theater god, yeah. Mark Ryland, right? Wow. I know none of this. I'm just standing back there and uh, thinking, what the fuck is he doing? And I have to do this kind of like Kramer farce quick entrance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the moment comes, uh, the laughter is just dying. Peals of laughter die down. My cue comes. I come on, I, I, I come on stage. Fly lands on my shoulder. I kill it. <laughs> oh, and oh, wow. Because I didn't know that he's, he's dating the fly. <laughs> <laughs> and this, I'm telling you, it was the, the sound from the audience was like, <laughs> and then laughter, and, and it was like a white, white carpet. And there is this like legs up dead massive guy. Oh no. Oh, my and God. I I start going up his legs and sure enough I mean it was like a, a solid 2 minutes of the audience going nuts. And I <laughs> I'm scared to look at his face. I get up to him, sure enough he's weeping. Oh, <laughs> oh my wow. God. And and I'm like are you are you okay? Uh and he says, why did you kill my fly? You know, and <laughs> we go off script uh, for like for like two minutes just uh, talking about why people kill flies. And I was upset because I'm a Quaker. I was raised Quaker. Mm -hmm. I don't kill flies. I take <laughs> oh. them outside. Uh, yeah. Anyway. That, 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 <laughs> oh, that was amazing. That is amazing. Wow. It was uh, a crazy moment. Hey, uh, a quick thing I want to talk about, uh, Mike Black. I, I think this is uh, something that we, we really should talk about. Yeah. And uh, it's a, um, a company yes. that was founded in 1983 in Tokyo, Japan, of course, I'm talking about the Zoom Corporation. Zoom. Now, if, if it wasn't for Zoom, and Matt knows this, we would not be able to do our show. Um, they make the best audio equipment in the world. Um, we, w Which one are we using right now? We, we're recording onto a Zoom live track L8 right now, and when we go do our live events at conventions and stuff, we often use the Zoom H6, and they're both just fantastic pieces of equipment. You plug your microphones in, you plug your headphones in, and you're good to go. Yeah, I mean, whether you're a classically trained pianist or a run-and-gun film, filmmaker or a podcaster like uh, you know like us um yep yeah i do a ton of podcasts and i can tell by listening when they're using a zoom and when they're not yeah it's uh, the mark of excellence it yeah. really is uh go check it uh, go check out all their stuff over at zoom-na.com that's zoom-na.com be professional for god's sake zoom-na.com all right okay let's get back to the show well, Brad, uh, uh, you're you, to to keep on the topic of of theater. You are uh, you are currently uh, in pre production or attached in pre production to play Mr. Stephen Sondheim in Lin Manuel Miranda's uh, Tick Tick Boom about the life of Jonathan Larson, the guy who. Uh, wrote the musical Rent. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and on top of that, you got Andrew Garfield uh, in there and you got Judith Light and Vanessa Hudgens. Like, 
that that fucking this fucking thing is going to be a monster. Uh, I, can't, I can't wait. We were supposed to be, uh, you know, shooting it, um, and uh, we were supposed to be shooting it in March. There's a rumor we're going back uh, in October. But yeah, I'm dying to do that. Lynn is truly one of the just the sweetest human beings on the planet. Always, we had the same. A uh, crazy, brilliant acting teacher uh, at radically <laughs> different times uh, <laughs> at the co- at Wesleyan, where I went to college. Uh, so we, had, you know, kind of. I mean, I remember, <laughs> like originally, Hamilton was going to be like an album. You know, Lynn would say, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's an album. I don't think it's a play. And you're, you know, and you're like, what is it? And it's like oh, it's a it's a hip hop uh, thing about the, about the founding fathers, and and you're like, oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had I had uh, I actually met Jonathan Larson um, when oh, you're kidding. when Randy Newman uh, had written a musical called Faust, yeah. and he put I it up love at, Faust. Yeah. Oh, amazing! And he put it up at La Jolla Playhouse, and I grew up yep. in San Diego, so I went to like the opening night of it, and Jonathan Larson was there because they were going to be doing Rent. And he was, it wasn't, Rent was only like being workshopped at the time. And I was on the little balcony at, at, uh, at the theater and standing next to him. And I was like, oh, what are you working on? He was like, oh, they're going to do my musical. I'm working on this thing called Rent. And it's really, it's, it's doing well in New York. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be something. And I was like, I was like, oh, that's, that's fun for you. Like I totally, <laughs> totally blew, blew it off. Like it was right. absolutely not, yeah. and it wasn't until yeah. you know he passed that I was like, oh my, oh my god, oh my god, yeah, oh my that god. conversation was insane. Yeah, wow. But yeah. yeah, oh my god, I remember the night that, um, that he died and how it resonated with everything that that play was about. Um, uh, and I know he means the world to, uh, to Lynn. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. I mean, what rent is what rent was is what Hamilton is currently. It's that it's that like that kind of energy of people yeah, waiting days and sort of. days to, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 um you know, it, it's one of those you know, once in a generation things that that uh totally changes the theater and uh, updates it, you know, like mm-hmm. chorus line, uh, you know, it's, the, you know, what chorus line, mm-hmm. uh, rent yeah. and Hamilton that, you know, change everything, man. When I saw Hamilton, I, I, I he, uh, he invited me. Um, and, uh, you know, I knew he was brilliant. I'd heard everything about it. Um, you know, I knew the conceit of it, but oh my God, I I I just started cr- I, I crying. I mean, it, it's not just a hip hop treatment of this. I mean, the, the songwriting in that is is just staggering. Yeah. I I I I, 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 I mean, this is not a unique reaction to that, but boy, yeah. no. But I I just saw it myself for the first time on Disney Plus like a week ago. And tried to explain it to my dad so poorly <laughs> that he may <laughs> never see it. But uh, it just, the effect it had on me, I couldn't believe it. I, I was like, this really is incredible. It's amazing how, oh, the- how some musicals do that. Like, I took my mom and my aunt and my uncle and all of us went together to go see Book of Mormon. Uh, and uh, and it we... I watched my uh, my elderly aunts and uncles crying, crying in the audience with laughter where they couldn't breathe anymore because wow. it was just so f- in- fucking amazingly funny. Like it's just, yes. oh my god, man, it's yeah, life, life theater is magical. Yes, yes, yes. I have to. Well, ask and because- I, I'll tell you something that really breaks my heart uh, now. Uh, I know. Uh, you know, I talk to young actors all the time, and there's this young guy, just incredibly talented kid, 
um, who just got out of what is probably the best musical theater program now, which is in uh, University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, he's just getting going in New York. Um, and I think Tommy Kale was going to use him in a workshop, the guy who directed Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And then now these guys just have to stop. Oh, and yeah. it's, it's terrifying to me the thought of how long it's going to be before a bunch of 70 year olds, um, you know, want to cram into a theater. Yeah, we used seriously. to joke. Yeah. I, I mean, the audience is old in New York and we used to joke. <laughs> I did a play with, <laughs> uh, uh, John Slattery and, uh, at Manhattan theater club. And we used to say that the theater slept 499. <laughs> 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 oh my god oh my god um we we have to touch on a couple of uh very important things um i, I look, very I mean, important <laughs> very important uh cabin in the woods scared yes. me so much when i saw it i actually had nightmares for three three straight days after seeing it uh it is a fucking incredible film yes, maybe my and, favorite uh, introduction to a horror film of all time oh yeah, absolutely you and richard jenkins yeah classic <laughs> What, uh, Jenkins. What was that like for uh, you? Uh, well, listen, I, uh, Joss Wheaton is, uh, Joss Wheaton went to the, the same college, um, uh, to Wesley. And so, uh, I knew Joss and, you know, it's so funny because I am so lucky. I, I you know, people, reporters will, will always say, you know, have you always been fascinated with the horror genre? And I'm like, no, like you know, <laughs> I, I don't wait for Saw Twelve. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I read uh, I read that script and I knew all my stuff was going to be with Richard Jenkins, who I think is one of the greatest actors on the planet. Yeah. And uh, we got to you know just improv and play. I made the mistake of improvising the line tequila is my lady so that <laughs> <laughs> anytime i walk into a bar uh, <laughs> the shots uh the shots come over but um yeah i i, I mean that was a blast and you know uh, joss is like fearless i mean you know run and gun and um uh I, I don't think there's a better sound effect gag <laughs> than the moment where the elevator arrives on the floor, goes ding, and just mountains of blood and entrails <laughs> come, come in. It's so, um, good. it's so good. But that movie almost didn't come out. MGM was like in bankruptcy or something, and it really it, 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 they waited a couple of years it was so good how did when you saw the the board that had all the names of all the different stuff uh like you know the merman and the vampires <laughs> yeah. and the zombies how close from your imagination was the final product of the film especially the merman well the merman i eventually got to meet one of the uh <laughs> Uh, I love that part of this, like, like just this, this guy's sort of weird kind of tiger beat <laughs> obsession <laughs> yeah, uh, with this creature and a kind of like tenderness around it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe laugh. Um, yeah, well, I, but you, we saw like the ballerina dentata and, yeah. um, you know, I, I, you know, I saw them at lunch. Oh, okay. Oh so they were on set. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. What, what else was on set? Like, cause uh, you know, and not just special effects. I met the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, awesome. And the, and the, and the, mer the merman was, you know, an actual blob that, um, that, that, ate me i did a you know i did a scene with it oh yeah that thing looked terrifying to me in in real life i was like <laughs> yeah, that would just... that's one of the ones i would want to be killed by the least oh, <laughs> yeah shit. yeah it's one of yeah, the things yeah, you're yeah. thinking as you're watching this movie is you know um yeah 
we uh, we got to bring up uh, our dear friend Marsha Gay Harden, mm-hmm. uh, who did our show and uh, told us stories about um, our uh, next door neighbor masturbating and watching her eat breakfast in the morning. Yes. Like super <laughs> fucking uncomfortable, <laughs> weird, in New York. amazing. Yes. God love that woman. Oh stories. my god! <laughs> when she was living in New York, yeah. she told she just like he told was in the <laughs> he was in the building across from her. And he would stand in his window naked. She was like, "Really?" On like, Every like the twentieth floor, or whatever. It was, okay. yeah, yeah, she was just well, was explaining the differences of New York and to that's LA. When she was, yeah. that's when she was doing uh, the one she got the Tony a- for, Angels in America. Angel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but, when when, you, when, you, when your name is Marsha Gay Hard, Marsha Gay Hard on. <laughs> yes. God love that woman. Um, we, uh, I actually was at her house to watch uh, the first episode of Trophy Wife, mm-hmm. and it was oh, wow. so fucking amazing because she had a bunch of her friends around and all mm-hmm. this stuff. But then we we sat there and we watched it, and then she was like, "Is it? Am I funny? Was it good?" And I was like, "Are you kidding <laughs> yes, me? Yeah. Like you're incredible!" Yeah. <laughs> but it was such a great show, and you were fantastic on it and you and just uh, just a lovely show i thought it was so great uh i i I loved doing that you know it's so funny because uh i I am basically at the point where it's the the television business is so stupid now because (laughs) well i guess it's it's always been stupid but that's a show like if you stay with it um, you know, the, the oddest sensation when you're lucky enough to work on a television show is you realize we're building the plane while we're flying it. Yeah. And uh, if you don't get, and that was a couple of years ago where they really didn't realize that in order to build an audience now, it, you know, it really takes time. Look at something like Shit's Creek. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. if, if, if Shit's Creek was... I'm sure they, and I know that, you know, the networks passed on it and I'm sure they were heartbroken, but they end up being given the license to sort of, you know, find the heart of the show. And then the thing becomes like a, you know, a massive hit. Mm-hmm. And I felt yeah. like that about, um, uh, about Trophy Wife. I felt like that about uh, the show. I just did Perfect Harmony. Oh, which uh, is a terrific show. Which uh, there, I, I, like, I'm not saying this, you know, out of desperation, but like, I, I there is no doubt in my mind that that show was going to find its audience. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah, it's it's a different thing because you look at shows, even like, say, Breaking Bad was struggling until well, it hit Netflix, yes. and all of a sudden, then they're like, oh, people discovered it then, and then it became the biggest thing on TV. And sometimes these shows need that opportunity to like find that audience, because there's so many things out there now, yeah. um, and I'm watching none of them, quite frankly, but there's so many well, new products out there. And it's like, you, you need to have a chance to let people talk about it and find it and discuss it on Twitter and on Reddit, and then, right. and then it can blow up from there. Yeah. I used to, you know, it's it's a little different now, but it used to be that HBO and Showtime, if they picked you up, you had a couple of years. And what they would do is they would really save their publicity, their push for the second year. Yeah. And they would, uh, I, 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 there's, a, there's a problem with marketing television shows. People, it's a very personal experience watching television. You're in bed with people, you know, Uh, and people use the way they talk about them is instructive. They'll say, oh, that's, oh, God, that's one of my shows. That's one of my, you Mm -hmm. know, that's my my show. Nobody says that about a movie. Yeah. So you have, and they don't want to be told that this is great. All of any show that you love, that changed television nobody thought it was going to be a hit if Mm -hmm. anybody thought that the sopranos was going to be a tenth as successful as it was david chase would not have been allowed to write it you never would have met gandolfini no way brian cranston would be cast in that Mm -hmm. no way would vince vince gilligan have the freedom to um you know to find it Uh, absolutely uh, yeah. And I think I, I think it's very interesting that that the development people should sort of you know 
understand, which is the really successful shows um, are allowed to develop on their own. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, and that was, that was true of West Wing just because Aaron was uh, constitutionally incapable, not, uh, <laughs> not, not uh, of, of like taking and taking a network note. Yeah. And yeah. So we, and so then you get an actual point of view. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, it's the shows they're not looking at. The Chappelle show is a perfect example yeah. of that. You know, and then as soon as the money went in, then they're like, "Oh, now we're going to start messing with it." And then it was right. like, "All right, yeah, well, the whole then, thing comes to an end." Yeah, uh, exactly. We, we gotta we gotta talk about uh, two other films uh, before we let you go, and we'll keep them tight. We'll keep it fast and tight. First fast one, fast and tight, fast and tight, fast and. <laughs> Why tight. do you have to phrase it like that? I don't know. It sounds weird, weird. now. Um, no, oh God! Uh, I'm hearing a clicking now. Is that <laughs> no? That's, no, I'm, that's, it's Gatorade. I'm, oh, it's you Gatorade. clicking? Good, good, You're good, the good. culprit clicking now. We're there trying we to do a podcast. We're trying to do a podcast. <laughs> okay, uh, Saving Mr. Banks. Um, yes, you played a real person. We uh, we uh, our podcast actually did the Disney Legends panel. Uh, hosted the Disney Legends panel with uh, Floyd Norman at and Comic-Con. Tom Cito oh, wow. at Comic Con uh, last year, and it was just, I mean, heart, just this heartwarming, like wonderful thing to be able to like to meet someone who worked on Dumbo is amazing. Oh my god! Oh yeah, and and this must have been an insane yeah, da, experience. Uh, wasn't it Don Don, Don DeGrotti? Uh, yeah, Don yeah. DeGrotti. Uh, and Richard Sherman was around. Mm-hmm. Um, God, he took us to this weird, <laughs> uh, um, uh, God, uh, he took us to this weird sing-along where I was sitting at a table with Richard Sherman, Sean Penn, and Mickey Rooney. <laughs> yes. Wow. Oh my singing, God. Singing It's a Small World After All, right? And... <laughs> That was proving it. Um, if that isn't a road uh, movie, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah. The four of you guys in a car. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, uh, that was a total, total joy. Uh, John Lee Hancock is, uh, I was in his, the first movie he wrote uh, was a Clint Eastwood movie that I was in called A Perfect World. Amazing oh, film. Of course. Yeah. Awesome yeah. movie. Amazing movie. Which, by the and, way, I don't know if you've taken a look at the movie poster for A Perfect World, but you have to take a look at this because there's a photo of Kevin uh, Costner. Kevin Costner, right? And he's photographed, and then there's the the kid that's standing next to him, but he's drawn. His face is drawn. So when you look at it, the kid looks like a weird alien next to a like, photo of Kevin Costner. Yeah, it looks like a painting <laughs> next to a. Fo- it's very. It's a very. It's amazing. Bizarre in my favorite way. Poster. Weird. Is- isn't he in like a Casper mask? He well, yeah. he is in, in parts of the movie, but like in this, it's when he had like the striped shirt on and shorts. It's because the the shot of Kevin Costner and the shot of the kid were not from the same scene in the movie. <laughs> right. So like, right. then they took the kid and they were like, "Hey, just draw his face in there. Nobody's gonna notice." And then now that everything's digital, it's like you blow it up and you're like, "Oh, that's weird. What is happening?" Yeah, it's it like the kid's face is melted. And yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. yeah. And someone's oh. cousin got to do the posters. <laughs> <laughs> I found out it's actually a legendary poster designer who did it. Like I oh, looked it up because oh, wow. I was curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's but Drew Struzan's cousin Gary <laughs> Struzan. <laughs> yeah, I'm so but sorry. I love that film, wow, Perfect World. So please, cuts. Uh, saving yeah. Mr. Ba- saving wait, Mr. Ba- wait, 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 wait. Uh, go back, go while back. we're on this, a little about yeah. Clint Eastwood, please. Yeah. Anything? Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, um, you want to? Uh, you want to? Oh, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> Make our day. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, it's been made. It, I, I mean, it is uh, absolutely true that, um, like, y- you, it's the first take. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that's and, it, right? And, and uh, often you don't know the camera's on. I mean, he will, <laughs> uh, he'll just, you know, look at his DP and go, all right, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, and then instead of saying cut, he'll go, well, that's enough of that shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, uh, I, it was funny because I asked him, I said, it, he was the first guy I met who didn't say action. And yeah. I said, why do you not say 
action. And he with us, uh, even though you're going on the first take and even though he's this, you know, sort of uh, iconic dude, um, uh, he's very sweet. He was very sweet with uh, the actors. Uh, uh-huh. He always felt uh, kind of condescended to um, – uh, as a young actor and directors weren't respectful and even though he wants you to go quick and get it done he's he's very sweet and i said so wh- why do you not say action and he said well you know i grew up on rawhide and people don't understand it's really hard to get a, a horse on a mark and <laughs> you get you get the horse on a mark and then this idiot director goes action you know? <laughs> 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 um, what was the other, oh, I, I I was on the set once, and he's like sitting in his chair with his heart beating, you know, once every three minutes, and I'm <laughs> reading the New York Times, uh, and it's right after that was the first time Costner had won the Oscar mm-hmm. in Dances of Wolves, and then the next year Clint uh, Clint had just won for Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading the New York Times uh, farts and seizure section, <laughs> and he's on the cover of it, and it's this iconic picture, uh, and the headline is like Clint Eastwood's vision of America, wow. um, <laughs> which showed how his work added up to this, you know, tapestry that he was putting together about America. And I walked over and I said, "Hey, did you see this?" <laughs> uh, when he looks at it, he goes, "Vision for America." It's like ten years ago, I was working with an orangutan, and now they think I'm Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny line. That's a great. That's great. Oh my god. <laughs> um, la- last big question we have to ask uh, before wrapping up: uh, the movie Get Out uh, ooh, is. Ooh is uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary film and changed the landscape of uh, not only film, but of like the conversations that were happening in the world. And yes. um, y- your role in it is, is <laughs> fucking am- it's so amazing. Yeah. Crazy. So crazy. Um, <laughs> what, what is, how has it affected your life that like after that movie coming out, what, well, anything. I mean, of course, we want to know anything about what it was like filming it. But the post of of you know, what's after the reaction? The, what's been to the you reaction then? to yeah. you in in uh, public? Well, and the world? It, uh, listen, uh, listen. It is the uh, if not the most lucky thing that ever happened to me. The second luckiest in terms of work. Oh. I totally got to be. Um. The, uh, the older version of me than audiences know in the coolest fucking movie <laughs> you could imagine. Um, and it, uh, you know, I don't think I would have handmaids uh, without that. It was, uh, uh, oh, yeah. it, it was, uh, an incredible piece of good fortune. I'll tell you, I, you know, I remember I'm, I'm in the room where I read the script and I, uh, I had been, I was obsessed with Key and Peele. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I kept saying to my agents and my manager, I'm like, just let me do a back, I just want to be on the set. I'll do a background cross. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was really, uh, I, I had called my agent i was really upset because i heard the show was going off the air and i'm like god damn it i like i really wanted to do that and they said well actually he's interested in you for this low budget thing um and then i get this uh script (laughs) i i I love how like i was totally wrong about everything it had a different title then i remember when uh, jordan comes up to me on the set and he goes hey man um i think i got the title and I'm like, oh my God, what is it? And he goes, get out. And I go, are you sure? <laughs> uh, dead, uh, you know, I'm dead wrong. Yeah. Dead wrong. 
But I read this script and I come out and I go to my wife and I'm like, oh my God, like, um, that's, there's scripts that are like forehead knockers that are like, like, I can't believe nobody did this. And I remember talking to him. He's like, hey man, do you, (laughs) the same question. Do you, do you love horror movies? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> um, and Jordan really does. Mm-hmm. And it he, shows. <laughs> he said, uh, when you talk to him about it, you realize he's like, horror movies are about um, things that you can't talk about. Mm-hmm. And you know they're about death, they're about sex, they're, uh, they're about the deepest things that we can't talk about. And clearly, race is something that we, can, <laughs> we cannot talk about. Yeah. And it had been so long, I mean, really since Night of the Living Dead, I remember talking with him, that race had really been put at the center, in my experience, of a horror movie. Yeah. Now, when you're reading it, I, I, I had... Um, first of all, you, when you're playing, you know, r- 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 an evil racist person like this, mm-hmm. if you get it wrong, it's going to be, re- <laughs> if you get the tone wrong, it's going to be awful. Yeah. Um, so, and when you're reading all the description of the sunken place on a page, it's, you know, it's very, very sort of hard, hard to imagine. This was a, Four and a half million dollar movie that we shot, I think, in 22 days, which is Man. completely, completely insane. And uh, w- people always say, did you know? And no, we weren't like, you know, everybody loved Jordan and wanted this to work. And we had really great actors uh, but we're going really fast and you have no idea how things, you know, will cut together yeah. and everything. And then I remember he, uh, he called me to loop and I'm like, how's the movie? And he's like, I think it's pretty fucking good. I think it's good. <laughs> uh, and, and I remember saying, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to think that you've spent, you know, two years on this, by the way, the whole time we're shooting, I'm saying to him, uh, you're an idiot, man. Why are you making a movie? You could, <laughs> like, like television is where all the cool stuff is doing. I, the whole time, I'm joking that this is a big career mistake. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, you know, because Jordan Peele, like Jordan Peele, could have uh, gotten a television deal after yeah. Keen Peele that would have set him up for life. Yeah, oh, and he's yeah. like, no, no, I, re- you know, I, I really wanted to do this. We all wanted it to be good. Um, he wouldn't uh, let me watch. I just saw a little when I looped, and then he invited me up uh, to Sundance. And man, I have never. <laughs> <laughs> it was this midnight showing, mm-hmm. and I have never seen the souffle <laughs> rise like that. I was just. I, I was. I was. I was. Uh, were, stun, stunned. Were you tempted and, to spend the rest of the weekend just hanging out in a cafe, like stirring a cup of coffee, banging the spoon uh, on it, <laughs> have people walk by? You know what's really funny is I, um, uh, the uh, a guy who is like a set photographer was on um, Perfect Harmony, uh, taking pictures, and he had uh, worked uh, on the film. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, I stole, uh, I stole a couple of the teacups. You want one? I'm like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, I have one for when people come over to date my daughter. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, but what's... how good was Daniel in that? I'm oh, amazing. Oh, man. Fantastic. God, he's yeah. so. And, 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 I, and I'm telling you, we're shooting as fast as I have ever shot in my life Mm -hmm. and every take every take that emotional that terror that he got to in that scene Mm -hmm. every take every take wow i mean unbelievable that is amazing my god Uh, and jordan is the sweetest human being on the planet mm -hmm. oh wow i mean 
Amazing. Uh, Bradley, I feel like there are so many things that we, mi- I mean, we fucking missed RoboCop 3, you know, <laughs> yeah. like there's well, stuff. Adventures yeah. in Babysitting. We skipped, we skipped a lot over we some were not things. able to get to. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, you are a phenomenal person yeah. and, a, and a great guy to be down to, to chat like this. And your career is just Ex- a lucky fucker, man. Dude, <laughs> it's extraordinary. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for, for doing the show, man. My pleasure. When are you guys going to be like making comedy, for God's sake? Oh, Everything's again, closed. We're, we're with, sitting at the When the, the audiences improv. come out, you know, yeah, again. Yeah, we're, we, we're, we were having a, improv we were right having a discussion with the regional manager today, and she was just talking about the struggles they've had about you know trying to do stuff outside or whatever and what's allowed and not allowed. So it'll be next year probably before we can do anything. But we do a live version of this podcast, and we'd love to have you on that sometime. Oh, yeah. We, we do our show yeah, live yeah. at the Holly, here at the Hollywood Improv in front of about 200 people, and we interview usually about three people live on stage yeah. you know short but we do q a stuff where the audience can ask questions and and win and, prizes oh, yeah. and the, yeah and win prizes and then we finish the show off by having a band usually from the 90s mm-hmm. do their like one hit wonder like song like lisa loeb got up and sang mm-hmm. um stay, stay. Yeah. uh the gin, yeah, the gin blossoms, blossoms got up and performed to close out the show and and uh that all, great all american rejects all sorts of bands have gotten up to to do yeah. cool stuff with us so it Maybe we'll get. Maybe we'll be able to get you at some point again uh, in the future yeah, yeah, yeah. when we're allowed you together. Guys, <laughs> do you guys know uh, Vargas Mason? Oh, yeah. I, sure. Yeah. I am from Colorado, and we did theater together in Colorado. <laughs> wow. Are you kidding? You know, he's married to my niece. Oh, oh really? That's awesome. Oh, that's a, that's, that's cool. a yeah, great. Yeah. About as great a guy as you could meet. So yeah. that's, I know. That's I know. Great. Do, do you know? Do you know? This is how I tell the story. He actually doesn't have a real sense of humor. <laughs> as much of a sense of humor about this as as I think he should. Oh, good. I want to hear All it. Right. Do you do you know about <laughs> when he uh, uh, he tours for the troops? You know, all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was at their. This is the way I tell the story. Uh, he was at their. Uh, it's the biggest military base. I forget. It's got a funny name in and it's in Africa. Massive. American oh, military okay. base, and uh, they're taking a tour, <laughs> and you know this uh, this uh, you know low ranking guy is like you know giving him a tour around the base, and they they notice their kennels, yeah. and this is where the the war dogs are, the dogs <laughs> that are trained for war. Wow. Uh, and somebody, uh, I think Vargas said, uh, and you know, they got the guys in the big padded suits, uh, and they said, is it safe? And the, the guy's like, yeah. And he said, like, could I do it? And, the, and he go, he says, let me talk to him. And he goes and, uh, he talks to a guy and they go, yeah, yeah. So, uh, they get Vargas in this, you know, that big padded suit with the, oh, no. you know, oh, God. <laughs> with the lacrosse helmet and yeah. this. This this is the only embellishment I put on it. Uh, it, it the, right as they're opening the door, uh, the uh, the guy says, uh, "By the uh, uh, by the way, don't run." <laughs> <laughs> no. And Var- Vargas panics, and like this pack of war dogs. <laughs> One like gets in front of him, and the other one trips him and like dislocates his leg. Oh my god! <laughs> Holy shit! So, so, so he's at a he's at a base, a military base. The guy the guy giving him the tour is now in big trouble. Yeah, because yeah. somehow we've injured the first comedian ever. You know? <laughs> and, and they and they couldn't treat him on the base. Because he's a fucking comedian, uh-huh. so he had to fly home with his like dislocated leg. Oh I just my love god! Him. Wow! My <laughs> god! He sicked war dogs on him. And, oh I, wow! He has not I, mentioned I, that. I, that is I, hilarious. I just, I just love that. Yeah. By, by the way, don't run. What? what? <laughs> oh oh my god! You know, I, I I know that we're wrapping. I know we're, we're ending here, but I I gotta tell you, um, a great fun quarantine movie, late night mm-hmm. Saturday night get some popcorn going uh godzilla king of the monsters was <laughs> oh, so fun and like 
crazy? Like just com- like like how many things, how many creatures can we pack in a movie <laughs> yeah. at the same time? And and you're right in the fucking middle of it. <laughs> yeah. What? Why? How? Why? What? The? Wow. What? Well, shooting those things is you know it's like everybody's super nice and uh, you know the director is great and everything but shooting those things is like it's like the death of joy yeah <laughs> i mean you know because you just have to do it over and over because they have to lay in all the um mm-hmm. you know all the the special effects and we're shooting like <laughs> there's a scene like in a- antarctica and we're in atlanta in, Aug- <laughs> in august in parkas in, like yeah. Toxic shutdown uh, <laughs> factory where they have just a football field full of uh, salt. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, they're blowing soap <laughs> in the air. We have, <laughs> we have air conditioners inside our down uh, mm-hmm. uh, suits. It was really crazy. Oh, wow. wow. God. Well, well, it's uh, a look, do you? Uh, I know that you use uh, d- Twitter a little bit um, because because I've uh, seen it. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> because you you and I follow each other on Twitter. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> or maybe that's yeah, the, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's awesome. Do you use uh, of any other social media so that people can follow you and and, and uh, keep in you touch? know I d- uh, my Instagram there's like some problem with it i occasionally get hacked by mm. right-wing loons oh. um, <laughs> yeah but it's basically twitter and um uh instagram so what's your twitter i think it's bradley whitford it's just bradley, okay yeah bradley it's bradley whitford yep um yeah. uh where, where can people uh where can people get you mr mike black where can people find you on all social media at mike black attack Real that is, easy. Yeah. That is true. What about you, Mr. Matt Walker? Where can people get you? Uh, I have links to everything at funnymat.com. And if you're upset by anything I said today, let me know at mattwalkersucks.com. <laughs> and people actually do do that, yeah, Bradley. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, people, uh, you can always find me at Stephen Glickman, S T P H E N Glickman, on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, uh, all the different places, all fifty-seven places. LinkedIn, <laughs> come find me. Um, Jesus. I know all fifty-seven God, varieties. It's, it's very hard to keep up with it all, um, but it is an absolute honor to uh, to talk to you. And thanks again so much for doing this, man. Hopefully, we'll get to talk my pleasure. Again soon. It was fun. We'll do it live. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. We'll do it live. It's a good Bill O'Reilly impression. That was great. There we go. Thank All you, right, Bradley. Have a good one, buddy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.